Welcome back to part two of episode 20 of the Lost and Found podcast, where we're taking a trip back to some of my favorite moments. In this episode, we're going to dive into clips from episodes 11 to 19. So I hope you love revisiting some of these. And if you're new to the podcast, hopefully you'll get a little feel for some of the episodes that you might want to go back and watch in full. Next week, we're going to be getting back into regular guests as I've had such a busy few weeks with some amazing opportunities coming up to work with the Center of World Philosophy and Religion with Dr. Mark Gaffney and Dr. Zach Stein with Aubrey Marcus coming on as the chair of the board, uh, as well as taking on an associate producer role for a new and exciting docuseries that I can't wait to give more details about. But for now, that's all I can say. Let's dive into this one and I'll see you next week with a fresh guest. I hope you enjoy. Yeah, I, if anything, I, I just think that maybe the conspiratorial bit is I think these things were banned and outlawed because, again, ego wants to have control. And if everyone can just go and have these substances and get this, not just an understanding of God, but get a direct connection and feeling God all through them and the realization of, oh, wait, God isn't just something external to me. God is through me and me all the time. Ah, okay, like that that changes the landscape. And maybe I'm redundant now. If I have this this house of God, well, you don't need to come to my house anymore if you can just access God whenever, wherever you like. Yes, and I'm glad you touched on that, Sabri, because not many people, I think, look at the, I, don't, I wouldn't even argue like conspiratorial, but I, I think it's a great word for it governments of today have replaced the church of 500 years ago because the quotes attributed to mark twain history doesn't repeat itself but it sure does rhyme if you look at the inquisitions of the past if you look at the way copernicus and others who were looking out were treated right it was challenging the earth-centric view and it was saying like I don't, I don't think the sun's i don't think we're you know the sun's revolving around us i think we're revolving around the sun and other plans are doing this what did the church do they killed those people or they locked them away you know and threw away the key they were preventing us as humans from looking out and now lol surprise surprise 21st century 20th century we're looking inward government's like oh you can't have that you can't smoke weed you can't do psychedelics we can't have that we can't have you questioning what we're doing and i i hope in in time the future humans look back and be like, wow, the church as primary institution was stopping us from looking out. And then they changed their tune. And thankfully, we're starting to change our tune on those substances, medicines, quote unquote, that can be used to look inward. Yeah, I think we're seeing a really interesting time where there does seem to be a shift. And, and it feels like the existing systems are very shaky right now. Very shaky. Yes, I, I hope that like, here in Texas, uh, you know, the rest of the country is really getting on board with marijuana. And you look at places like Denver and the state of Oregon, with psilocybin now are starting to think more progressively. And I'm still in the backwoods here in Texas. And it's really behind. And I'm starting to realize that this may be the last state to sort of even get to the, the marijuana side of the table. However, I think yeah, I was I was listening to John Oliver about this, and he was saying this is like the 70s, the 60s and 70s, when we seemingly had a chance and we kind of fumbled, uh, you know, or, or insert term as far as taking it to the finish line versus now it seems to be happening again. However, we have big pharmaceutical companies who are trying to patent, uh, like they're even trying to patent psychedelic uh ceremonies and like even they're trying to patent like talk therapy involving psychedelics and john oliver was making fun of them and so far as you can't patent therapy you know you can't patent a conversation and so it'll be interesting to see what happens with that um it'll be interesting to see what happens because i i know there's people like you and me the people you have on your show and then i know there's the general public and people that i've talked to her in the general public there's certain individuals who they say aren't that abrasive and they'll listen to them and then they'll say there are these other people who seem to be up in the air and they may not be helping the cause just from what i'm hearing the general public and i think for you and me we vibe on it for your guests for your listeners we vibe on it the general public like how do we bring them along without scaring them right because here in the united states we have aaron Rodgers talking about ayahuasca the, the nfl quarterback i'm grateful that he's talking about it However, I don't know if he's doing it in as an intelligent of a way as I would like to bring the general public with him 
Mm. And that's what I hope that we do. I'd be curious your take on that as well. Yeah, it's a really good point. I think I think that's part of the power of of podcasts and actually people feeling okay with talking about it and putting it out there. And I think what we're seeing more and more now, if you take a look at you and I, we maybe don't look like the typical people that at one time society would have considered the people that are taking the psychedelics and talking about love, light, and spirituality. It's at one time, maybe it was correlated with quote unquote hippies and people that almost seem like they didn't want to fit in with regular society. And I think what we're seeing now is, is more and more people where to the everyday person would look at someone like you and I, and we, we look like one of them. And for people listening, I'm doing like some quotation marks. Um, and I think actually that kind of lowers the guard a little bit. It almost lowers the defense where we being more relatable where, you know, the, I guess the, the country club that I go to, you know, a lot of people that go there in the city that I'm in are generally kind of for this city, it's the more successful people. And I'm having these conversations all the time. And because I'm in you know, kind of decent shape and I articulate myself pretty well, and I drive a fairly nice car and, and those things, they actually meet me with more intrigue because I think it's more relatable. And I think we're seeing more of that now. I think we're seeing more people that are kind of just relatable and, and going beyond that, people that are also in good physical shape, that are into fitness, into health, that are well-read, educated, and are talking about spirituality, psychedelics, and that. And I think that actually is really important for this to be spread into more mainstream culture. I really appreciate you touching on that because I think that's how we do it. And so for anybody who's listening, trying to meet that person who some people may say are more asleep or are not as conscious and meeting them where they are with their level of understanding and then bringing them over. It's like Dolores Cannon talks about this as well, actually. There's the people who are, no matter how much positivity you throw at them, no matter how much you're trying, they'll never get there. But there are those people. It's, it's like in America with our unfortunate two-party system. There's people in the middle. And if you're on one side or the other, those are the people that you can bring over it with certain arguments versus the person who's on the other side of the spectrum. Like you're probably never going to get that person. And so mm -hmm. I, I agree with you, Sabri. How can we connect with those people who are maybe in the margins and show them like, hey, I'm, I'm a functioning human and I still have these wild out there theories about life that other people agree with me on. And if you want to have a conversation, you know, I'd, I'd love to talk to you about it, but past that, like you said, you know, how's the weather? How's the favorite, you know, what match are you going to this weekend? Like I can have that conversation in addition to the more esoteric spiritual for those people who want to go there. It's funny, you know, when we were in Paris, my uh, wife has two stepbrothers who are French and one of them is 25 and he's, he'll probably be like a PhD in psychology and we're walking through the Louvre and he brought up psychedelics. And I was, I was like, oh, you don't say, you know? And I've never had this conversation with him. And I just started probing and Dayla was joking like, wow, you, you hit on, you know, a favorite topic of Sean's. And I was like, did you, like, did you know this about me? I was like, cause he follows us. He listens to some of my content. And he said, I had no idea. He said, you guys just asked me like, what have I been into lately? And he said, with the programs he's in for school, the data now around psychedelics and depression and whatnot, he said, it's too much to ignore. And so he said that he's taken some classes. He's looking at a certification. He's thought about guided ceremonies. I've been fortunate enough to host half a dozen or so guided ceremonies officially. Like I used to kind of do them for friends, you know, in my earlier psychonaut days, but being able to have that conversation with him, who's coming at it from a purely intellectual educational standpoint of like, this is what I'm learning in university. And now being able to talk to me about it and making it more normalized. I think that's where we need to get to. I've recently only came across the idea of the Bodhisattva vow and the idea that you have like repeated lives where you know, if, if you're a spiritual warrior, each time you're coming back, you're the spiritual warrior. Like, sure. Can you highlight it? I, I've only heard that very briefly. I don't know much about it at yeah. all. Well, the first, I mean, the first thing is just mythically. So even before, even before we take that 
idea as somehow being kind of cosmologically correct. Let's just put that aside. And if we just look at it kind of mythopoetically, meaning the stories we tell about ourselves and about who we are have a profound impact on our consciousness, right? The brain believes what it is you imagine and what it is you tell yourself. So, so the first thing is, is you've got to be very careful about the story that you tell yourself, that it's an empowering story, the most of kind of empowering story so that you can face the challenges of the world that you're facing. In that sense, that your personal narrative, to some extent, is a skillful means, right? Meaning um, how you see yourself in the Buddhist tradition is an important part of practice, and the story that you tell yourself is an important part of practice. So for what I mean by that is, is even the story of multiple lifetimes. So if we were to take you and we were to just take you and pick you up right now and drop you 300 years ago and to get a sense of who, who you are right now and what you might be doing then and pick you up and drop you another 300 years and just kind of go back like that. And just get a sense of us knowing you as you are, because the truth is people don't change that quickly. <laughs> like if we could like place you back through history, let's go like, you know, give yourself 200, maybe 3000 years. So maybe you just drop yourself in these historical moments of time. What do you envision and imagine that you'd be up to? How do you know? Well, you're kind of up to it right now, because as I said, people change slowly. So the important thing about that is, is it gives you a sense of mythology and a sense of story that is, that is grounded and rooted in deep time, do, rather than just Sabri, that, you, that you're just this thin veneer on a bunch of dead guys. Mm. If those dead guys are also you, if your story penetrates deeper into the past, it gives you a deeper sense of like, I'm really behind what I'm doing. Why? Because I've been doing this for a while. Mm. Right? So now, whether that's true or not, the truth is even the story you tell yourself about Sabri isn't true anyway, right? I mean, most of the story that people tell you about themselves is a bunch of, is made up. So before we even go into like the reality, the importance of establishing a deep sense of meaning in the past, because those were the lessons that you and I went through. These are the lessons of history, right? If you don't understand the lessons of, of your own sacred history, right? If you don't have a sense of where you might have been 1,200 years ago, you know, and, and, and to the extent that you do, you begin to get a story of your story. Now, even if that isn't true, it's still your story because of those are still people like yourself who, who struggled with the things that you're struggling right now, but it's a, it's a little bit different to struggle that when you've got the, you know, the Spanish Inquisition bearing down on you right it's a little different so so that's the first thing is that's that is an important exercise exercise in and of itself to inform you about who you are because of course you and i contain all of that history within us anyway mm. yeah then we can turn to the future and then we can also ask ourselves well what what kind of projects are worthwhile investing in that are going to give fruition 300 to 400 years in the future. Now, if you don't take 300 and 400 years in the future personally, then you're just going to like, you know, you're just going to like serve yourself. On the other hand, if the vision is, is, is larger than yourself. Now, these higher stages of development, much like the, the painting behind you, right? Those higher stages, one of the measures of like, if somebody functioning at a higher trait is also how they see time if, if are there somebody who's making decisions based on the quarter like the next three months the year 10 years 25 years 100 years 400 years or a thousand years now you train your you can train yourself to make decisions based on the fact that a thousand years matters right now when you do that you're going to open up and you're going to certainly be interested in a bunch of information and a bunch of thinkers in medicine and art and da 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 who are thinking like that. And guess what? They'll be the cutting edge of humanity. It doesn't mean that you don't think about brushing your teeth in the morning, but it does mean that you understand these gears, right? 
piece of gears. Now, so this is even the idea that the, the, that it that reincarnation isn't a reality. But then, if you then bring in the like the really high con, con, you know contemplative tech, and of course our culture lacks that, but the Tibetans have like super high tech in terms of actualizing this kind of stuff, right? In terms of developing the capacity to reincarnate at will, having the experience of being able to leave your body, being able to transcend space and time, this you know the the contemplative curriculum. Now, granted, you don't know because you're let's say you're just beginning that curriculum. However, if your mentors are twenty years ahead of you and they are more ethical, more responsible, more courageous, and more engaged than you are, and they're doing these practices. Then you begin to develop trust, right, in lineage, like trust, because that's how it works. You know, it's you kind of you need your elders. You can't do it by yourself. If you try and educate yourself, you're going to end up, you know, educating yourself with your peers. I've come to recognize that all of our physical disease comes from emotional disease first. Uh, and so, just last year, actually, um, I had my third recurrence of oral cancer. And um, the first two were in 2009, 2011, and they were based around the binge drinking. That was what was causing the oral cancer. Um, and then I was cleared by doctors in 2018. They said, unless something massive happens, um, like the spot in the mouth there, like really changes, you don't have to come back. And so um, when I went to do the ayahuasca in 2021 and this shame was revealed to me, that spot in my mouth changed it kind of, it, it got a little activated and it, it, you know, it's one of those things in the mouth where it's like, you know, even the littlest thing feels like it's the size of your whole mouth. And so I kept an eye on it and it, and it kind of, it, it didn't change much more after that. So I'm like, okay, I think it's, it's pretty good. It's not growing. It's not getting anything better any any worse. And then um, last year I went to Burning Man and after Burning Man, it was literally an open wound in my mouth, that spot. And so this was the doctor in my ear, like if something ever happens with that spot, go see somebody. And so I went to see two doctors uh, beginning of November and they both looked at it and they were like, yes, that's absolutely cancer. Like we need to get a biopsy pretty, really quickly, like within the next six weeks and um, determine what stage it is in the treatment plan. And in that moment, I said, um, I, I knew this is not a physical thing. This is, I don't physically like have cancer. You know, I'm experiencing cancer right now, but I knew that this was, it, first of all, that it was not physical. And second, like I knew that this is not the beginning of something. This is the end of something. So that shame that was recognized in 2021 spent the next 18 months leaving my body through this spot in my mouth. And so then um, November, beginning of November, so end of November, I went down to Costa Rica to serve psychedelics that I serve and sit with ayahuasca. And the last night of ayahuasca, I was shown basically every, for the last four hours, I was shown every experience in my life where I have felt shame, embarrassment, shame, guilt, remorse. And um, I came back from that trip to Costa Rica, got the biopsy done and the cancer was gone. Wow. And, yeah. And so, um, because I, it was the purging of that shame. It was the, it was like, you know, the final boss in, in Mario. Like I just had to, I had to just finally let this, let myself experience this shame and let it out of my body. And, and that's, um, that's been the most profound learning of probably of my lifetime is that, you know, we get to really move these things through our body. And as this healing goes and whether it's, you know, childhood illness or addiction that ended in, for me, it ended in 2012. And, you know, that's when I started looking at all these things, the depression first, the anxiety, the, the mental illness side of it all. And then now it's become this really deep path of spirituality and plant medicine and, and consciousness that has allowed me to access parts of me and access beliefs and access ways of healing that are all wrapped, it, wrapped into the, basically who I am now and what I do. That's amazing, man. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you for asking. For people that aren't aware of like the idea of like 3D and 5D and these different dimensions, could you kind of give a little overview of that? Our soul resides in 
multi-dimensional multi-dimensionality as a source being we are at one with all that is we then decide that we want to we either volunteer to come back to earth or we are we we must come back to earth to serve our revolution so we look around we go oh i'll have that parent and that parent and like that, that's going to work for my soul and all the lessons i need to learn in this lifetime the soul then enter leaves source energy and enters into what we call duality this is the realm of duality up and down masculine and feminine dark and light black and white this is the realm of duality so the soul enters into duality it enters into a realm where for the most part everyone has forgot the truth about where we come from because we've had these these religions which have distorted the truth even though the truth is in the sacred scriptures the way they've been interpreted and enforced upon humanity is is not correct so we incarnate into these lower dimensional realms and what defines us as being part of duality is our kundalini energy so when we incarnate we all have sleeping serpents that reside at the base of our spine called the ida and the pingala the magnetic and electric force of our of our true nature when they are when we incarnate until we have a spiritual awakening the kundalini energy the kundalini and the kunda buffer energy are asleep they're dormant they're, they're, they're comatosed and this comatose state represents spiritual amnesia represents spiritual forgetfulness mm. what 99 percent of people on this earth are in spiritual forgetfulness so if you are interested in astrology interested in the light interested in angels you're going to get on your spiritual path it may be martial art whatever it is there's going to be something great writers whoever knows but there's going to be something that pulls you onto your spiritual path as you then embark on your spiritual path eventually you will have an experience whereby your kundalini energy um gets triggered gets pushed to wake up when that happens for the most part the divine feminine serpent at the base of the spine wakes up and the divine masculine is fast asleep. She's like, wake up, wake up. And she starts prodding him, wake up, wake up. And he's like, oh, oh my God, oh God. And then, and, then they're, and then they're both like that at the base of the spine and they're both awake. And this has been triggered by going on a spiritual journey. This activates and triggers the Kundalini energy to come out of its dormant state. In that moment when they're, they're they're both erect at the base of the spine, they recognize each other and then they rush together in divine, holy, sacred union. This is the inner internal, uh, inner alchemical marriage, which I which is what I speak about in great great depth in my book. As they merge at the base of the spine, they they come into sacred union. So when the when the serpents are asleep, this represents. Um, this represents separation, the, 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 the consciousness of separation. Whereas when they come into, come into union, this is the consciousness of marriage, of divine sacred union. Now, when the serpents meet and merge at the base of the spine, they then begin to ascend up through the chakra system. And as they start, as the Kundalini and the Kunda buffer start moving up the, the chakra system, they they start purging all of the memories and the trauma that is held in the chakra system it is not for the faint-hearted and then eventually the kundalini energy moves up to the heart center once the kundalini energy sort of like reaches the heart center it, it activates a, a, a very powerful gland in our body which is the thymus gland and this is the seat of unconditional love so as the kundalini energy meet, meets and merges in the heart center we start activating our higher dimensional consciousness it starts really 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 massively coming online we start going into spiritual bliss and we start awakening to the fact that we are children of god we are children of love we our soul essence was created in unfathomable love and when our journey is complete we will return home to that unfathomable love and we awaken to divine love unconditional love as then the kundalini energy moves up through the throat chakra 
clearing, purging, it gets to the pineal gland. And this is where it gets very, very, very interesting because it then, it then connects with the pineal gland which is the third eye and it connects with the pituitary gland which is the electromagnetic organs in the brain and once the kundalini energy starts interacting with the pineal gland and the pituitary gland it it starts sending pulses to them and these pulses then orchestrate a release of a secretion which they speak about in the bible which is called the milk and the honey and so so the kundalini energy triggers the release of the milk and the honey um i can't remember the technical words for them but then they then merge within the claustrum and then the the claustrum is where we get the word classroom from the claustrum and then the claustrum then starts releasing what is called the christ oil and then and this is what i've gone through and this is what i speak about in the book and then one, once the Christ oil, you may have gone through it as well, like from what you said, but when the Christ oil starts getting released, we we go into nirvanic consciousness. We go into nirvanic consciousness and we start having access to the to the sacred scriptures we start having access to the akashic records we become full-blown psychic we become full-blown spiritual doctors spiritual healers we are able to read energy with our eyes closed just like we, we become super psychic our third eye blasts open and we begin we begin to understand the true nature of reality so I've explained clearly that prior to the Kundalini awakening, we are locked into duality consciousness, separation consciousness, a forgetfulness about who we are as spiritual beings. But when we go on our spiritual path and we then experience the merge of our Kundalini energy at the base of the spine and the ascension of the Kundalini energy, we then realize I am one with all that is. There is no separation. Separation is a lie. Separation is a perception. The truth is the divine union i am one with god so it's like it's, you understand that life is a tapestry and every single thread is intricately connected there's no separate part of the tapestry you understand your place in the divine tapestry of existence mm. and so that is unity consciousness that is christ consciousness that is fifth dimensional consciousness that is higher dimensional consciousness and it's called entering into the point into the zero point field the zero point field is the place within our consciousness where all dimensional realities and all timelines converge in so this is not a third dimensional linear planet this is what the controllers have had everyone believe we are multi-dimensional avatars residing in no time and all time and so when we have our kundalini awakening we awaken to the fact that we are spiritual avatars and we are not governed by third dimensional time as we have been conditioned to be do you think to the capacity in which you can give yourself that space to express how you feel also gives almost a an equal reflection of your ability to hear other people and for them to be who they are yeah so i've noticed uh, for myself that the deeper um the deeper i love myself and have compassion and understanding of who i am um the more i can relate to others and empathize with them so it's been it's been tremendous in not only my friendships but especially my romantic relationship we've gotten through depths uh in the past year with my partner depths so deep that um that i i hadn't even had that level of connection with with a uh, ex-wife I had with for four years, you know, after, after two or three months of this relationship, uh, of just being completely transparent and honest with each other. And, and I mean this in the sense of like my honesty and my truth to this, per, to my partner is, is more important than the relationship itself. So I have a, a tier system of my priorities, Scott's body health, his physical, mental body health, uh, his full expression. Um, and anything that I give my word to. And then after that is my sacred union, my partnership. So the fact that I choose myself um, always makes it, it makes it to where my partner knows 
all of me. And, if, and for her to unconditionally love all of me, she needs to know all of me. So I keep any truth from her, then she's not truly loving all of me. And I, and I can't, I can't fully receive if she says, Hey, Scott, I love you so much. I love all of you. It's like, well, I haven't told you this. You need to know everything about me. Um, you know, radical honesty. And so I, I let her know everything about me so that when she loves me, she fully loves me. I got, I think I got a little tangent there, but yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's right. So yeah, so the deeper I love myself, the deeper my love for others goes. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, one of the things that Dr. Gaffney talks about is love being a perception. And it's I see you. And, you know, one of the things that came up in our conversation was, you know, I kind of had the recognition that if I don't allow myself to be seen, I'm actually not allowing myself to be loved. Because if you like, to your point, what you just said there, if you can't see me in my entirety, you as much as you might want to love me in my entirety, you actually can't because I'm not being seen. I'm not showing myself. Yes. Yeah, intimacy into you, you see me or something like that. Into me, you see. <laughs> yeah, that's what I say, intimacy. Um, and I learned that the hard way. I banged my head against the brick wall for a long time because I hid my my desires from my partners. And it caused this layer of distrust and resentment energetically, energetically. It wasn't always that they caught me in a lie, but they could feel I wasn't present. And uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with Dr. Gaffney. What does, what does sex mean to you? Oh, sex to me is an, is an energy exchange. It's a creation energy exchange. It's, it is sacred. Uh, I am learning my, I'm learning my relationship with sex deeper and deeper. Uh, the more experience I have. I used to give it out frivolously, um, looking for validation, whether it's for my performance or, uh, yeah, or worthiness. But the more I learn about myself and sex, the, the more sacred it's becoming. It's very magical. It can be my partner. I use it to alchemize um, certain traumas. So this is this is a really fun territory um, for healing. A lot of like sex is, is the most vulnerable space that I believe I can be in. And for most people, you're being seen fully naked. Um, you are in a very intimate container. Um, and a lot of shadows can come up um, for me and my partner that we have an opportunity to work through them and talk through them. Like, am I enough? Am I too much? Do I want too much sex? Am I good enough for you? Am I sexy enough for you? Uh, and presence um, is, is huge. Eye contact is, is big for me in that one. If I can't make eye contact with my partner, it means there's something that's on my mind or in my heart that I need to, to let out. I need to be seen. Um, sex is sacred. It's very important to me. It keeps me grounded. Uh, I can be, I can be, a, I am a visionary, so I see a lot of things. I want to create things. I can get lost in my creations if I'm not careful. But sex will ground me into this reality. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think I'll end there on, on what sex needs to be. Before you arrived at this point of what it means to you now, what might it have meant to you five or ten years ago? You know, I was thinking about this uh, the other day, about my, my relationship to sex uh, growing up, even in my teens. I was under the impression that... Uh, that uh, some part of this is true for some people, but I was in the, the frequency that that sex runs the world. Uh, the only reason why anybody does anything is because of sex. The only reason why people um, get a job or try to make money is so they can have access to more sex. So my my uh, view on the world was very narrow. It was only through the lens of sex, and everybody's because that was where I grew up. My dad was a uh, he was he was a jack of many trades. He was a uh, school teacher. He was a uh, construction worker. He was a, a stripper or an exotic dancer. Uh, and I, I mean, hell, I grew up, um, dad would come home from a show, a bachelorette party or something like that. It'd be midnight or 1 a.m. He'd wake the, the kids up, me and my two older sisters, and we'd go through the black duffel bag, pull out a thong and move it around. And we'd dump out uh, all the dollar bills and the $5 bills. We'd, we'd um, 
we'd, uh, we'd uh, sort out all the denominations. So sex was just like in your face, or it was in my face at a very young age. Um, and I, so my, my, my bar for sexuality is really low. It's just like, and that's why I have to be careful because not everybody's attuned to sexuality as much as I am, or as much as I, I am. So uh, yeah, uh, sex was just like, uh, everything was an ends to sex and sex was that means, you know, everything was ends to a means and that means was sex. That was my viewpoint for a long time uh, until the past few years I've been digging deep. I was like, oh, there's a lot more to life and beauty uh, and experience of it. So it's been fun. It's been a fun journey. You mentioned about being a people pleaser. Um, mm -hmm. how, how did that show up for you in relationships? Because I feel like this is a nice segue into some of the relationship stuff. Yeah. What first comes to mind is a book called No More Mr. Nice Guy. Have you heard of this book by any chance? Yeah, but I've not read it. It's so good. And it doesn't resonate with every man, but I think most men, that it has some golden nuggets within it. And I would say a good chunk of men are like, holy shit, this is me. And one of the core concepts in the book is this idea of being a people pleaser or being a nice guy is another way to say it. And it's society has glorified men being really agreeable and nice and uh, essentially doing whatever anybody wants of them at the expense of being really solid, trustworthy, high integrity men, being, being real people. And so, yeah, the people pleaser thing is, I think, a, a plague of the masses. And I would say in particular for men, it's, it's certainly women too, just shows up differently, I suppose. Uh, so yeah, it's, I would historically avoid conflict and confrontation at all costs because I had this idea that being nice, that didn't fit into being nice. Uh, when actually it's the nicest thing to be real with someone. Uh, and it also reminds me of the idea of, of love. Love is not always rainbows and butterflies. It, it sometimes is fun, conditional love. It's like, ooh, if I really want to love you at the highest level, I got to break this bone fully and reset it as opposed to putting a Band-Aid on that bullet wound and just bleeding out over time. And so that's a lesson I've definitely learned the hard way, so to speak, but it's a valuable lesson that I continue to learn at higher and higher levels. Yeah, and again, you know, it kind of points to the nuance within the idea of being nice. It, because nice... It's nice to be nice, right? <laughs> right. But there's also, there's actually the shadow of nice, which is mm -hmm. I abandon my boundaries. I don't value yep. my sense of self or, or my own needs. And people can abandon that. And that's really the shadow of being nice, where actually I put everyone else before me and mm -hmm. you know, possibly to my, to my detriment. Yep. Yeah, so agree. Yeah, and in, in relationships, especially, man, the past, I feel like this season, I've been in a season of shooting people straight and having really uh, radical, again, fun, comfortable conversations. And I'm starting to realize that that is one of the most important loving things I can do for anyone. And especially for men, I want to, in my opinion, how I approach men is, is very different than I'll approach a woman in this kind of conversation and, and like really addressing slash superseding the people pleaser stuff. And I mean, I even think of like a few situations in my past where I didn't share something with someone because I didn't want to hurt their feelings. I want to be a nice guy, be a people pleaser. And then that person suffers because they didn't get that radical feedback and have, I, I wasn't, willing courageous enough to be that mirror like hey there's this thing i'm noticing and obviously there's there's such a an important nuanced way to approach those kind of conversations where i maintain their dignity and i'm also not like projecting and, and shooting on them and like you are this or you're that it's like that's that's the dance of language too because they're i've heard it said when i speak i'm praying and i'm casting spells so i want to be very mindful of what i'm praying and whatever spells i'm casting um, but nonetheless, I, I think that that is one of the major antidotes in society right now is in particular, courageous men 
being willing to hurt people's feelings, not because not coming from an egoic place or even that I need to fix you. It's, it's that I, I love you and I care about you. I care about humanity. I care about the people in my world. And so I'm willing to have you not like me to maybe even hurt your feelings and perhaps even like ruin our relationship because the North star that I'm looking to is I love you. And I see, I hold this vision for the highest expression of you. And I want all the people around me to be aware of that and to be looking to that ideal. Cause that's what I'm doing for myself. And that's important. I think maybe the bit that makes people feel uncomfortable about that honest truth. And like you said, being willing to hurt someone's feelings. I think very often growing up, the reference we have for our feelings being hurt often can be through malintent or through like a malicious behavior. Yeah. So I think we actually then hold the idea of hurting someone's feelings as a malicious thing to do. But to your point, when actually, no, no it's deeply rooted in love. So you can access that highest expression of who you are. And of course, the intention isn't to hurt the feelings. The intention is to offer that truth to allow for growth. It's different. And I think there might be a lot of people that listen to these types of podcasts because this is a podcast of like inner growth, introspection, spirit, like spiritual uh, growth. And a lot of those people are very often kind, benevolent people. And with those characteristics, the idea of being honest enough to hurt someone's feelings can make them feel uncomfortable. So I think it's actually an important thing to understand that when it's deeply rooted in love, it's it's a beautiful gift that you can offer to someone, especially if it's not coming from judgment, that feeling yep. of non-judgment. And actually, no, like, brother, sister, I'm, I'm saying this really out of love. And when they can feel that, I actually think it's a beautiful gift to offer. And as I really started to get into this work, I started to realize the words that we use are really important. And the concepts and infrastructure we have in our minds around those words really direct our relationship with them. And there's an energy and whatever, uh, uh, the way that I conceptualize it is like, you're given a box of what this thing is, you know, from the people who are teaching you and they're either teaching you consciously or unconsciously, um, mostly unconsciously, I think, um, in, in previous generations. And so there's an idea of freedom and our ideas of freedom when I was growing up were apple pie and baseball and boating and American flags and fireworks. And they were all aesthetic. And then I was looking at the reality of how we live and seeing we still have indentured servitude, this whole debt cycle that everybody's in over here. It's not everybody, but most of us are in here. That's just indentured servitude with fancy titles and names that you seemingly opted into it was your choice but then again were you given a choice no when you go to high school you go to college you go to dinner, right um and even if you didn't want to do that there weren't really many options you're gonna to have to be a bartender or a car mechanic or you're just gonna be fucked if you don't do this and even just not being allowed into certain spaces if you don't look a certain way and have a certain social status like all of these things are, are prisons right those are all cages and the more i started to ask myself, what is freedom? What the, what the fuck is that? Um, around the time I was 25, I also shifted out of doing revolutions. And it just came to me in a meditation to just pick a word and be with that energy and experience it all year, create that experience for myself so I could know it. And the first one I chose was freedom. And the more I got into that, the deeper I got, the more I realized my freedom comes from within. It comes from me. It's my choice. Who says if I'm free or not? Well, I don't want my circumstances to tell me that. Even if I'm locked in a cage and chained up, I don't want my circumstances to tell me that because then I'm a slave to my circumstances. And I was reminded of uh, this man I learned about um, in high school. I'm probably aware of him, Victor Frankl, the Holocaust survivor. Yeah, we, we read a lot of his work. And I just remember in one of his stories, um, I think he went, he was in several concentration camps, but I think uh, the one he tells the story from is Auschwitz. And he just talked about how no matter what was going on, and we're talking about this man is literally experiencing the worst of human nature, the absolute worst. No matter what was going on, he knew that his dignity couldn't be taken away. His hope couldn't be taken away. His self-respect, none of that could be taken. That was his choice to keep or not. And he chose to keep it. He chose love. In the darkest of, of circumstances, he chose love. And I remember that clicking with me and going, that's fucking freedom. That's a powerful creator. 
And oh, my heart's just like pounding when I say this. And I, I was like, okay, that's my path. That's my model. And uh, that to me would be the dream if we're in one. We all feel free and empowered and we are not more powerful than our, we are not less powerful than our circumstances. We're more powerful. Yeah, that's where I sit on that today. It's beautiful that you share that. And before I say what I'm about to, for the listeners that might be interested in Victor Frankl, it's so Man's Search for Meaning is the is the book that's that's uh, that's well known that he did. Um, but getting back to what you said about freedom, so I've just been building my kind of offering, which is going to be a, a longer coaching program, starting out at, at six months. But actually, over time, I think I'm going to make it a twelve month program, and it's called Freedom Within. Oh yes, and it's it's myfreedomwithin.com. Uh, and it's for me, it's, it's broken down into three segments. It's the freedom from the past, being free of all the, the, the story, the things that we hold on to, both the, on the individually, like unconscious level, but also the collective unconscious, being, being free of our past, of our story. And the second phase is the freedom to be. The freedom to be who you are, fully expressed in the and the depth and the essence of your soul, the way that the divine intended you to be. And then it's the freedom to become. The freedom to become not from a place of emptiness, not from a place of lack, not from a place of my ego desires this, but from a place of my heart and soul yearns to become the way that an acorn yearns to become an oak tree. It's not because it's wounded. It's not because it's got an ego. It's not because it's got something to prove, but within its fabric of existence, there's a yearning to become that because it knows that's what it was born for. And the, the offering that I have been really working on for the last six months of really, like, so much time spent on this and I'm bringing in kind of guest teachers for it, but it's, yeah, there's freedom within. It's the freedom from the past, the freedom to be and the freedom to become. And, and for me, I think sometimes people think they're searching for happiness. I don't think it's happiness. I think it's a sense of freedom. That, that freedom within. Yeah, I love the architecture of that. The way that you have broken that down, I was like, that that has been my exact path. And I have just arrived in this freedom to become space. And the way Scott and I talk about it is like, we got out of the pit of victimhood and now we're on level ground and we're just in pure creation space now. The, the, the past is no longer my reality. You know, I've, I've, I've let those things go. And I remember... I remember when I had this moment because there was a lot of this rhetoric, especially in the spiritual community, when I started my healing work, that you're going to be healing forever. You're always going to be healing. And once I started, you know, getting more refined in my coaching, more refined on my path, more, more information, more resources, more tools, more, more teachers, I realized that's a, that's a story. That's a narrative. That's a spell I'm casting. I will always be working on the healing. If I say I will always be working on the healing. What if in this moment I just choose to be healed? What if it's just a choice I get to fucking make? Hey, I'm good. That shit happened. I'm still standing. I'm better for it because I choose to be. I'm healed. And I remember I did that. I, I like to do, um, I do uh, guided psilocybin journeys with people. So it's one of Scott and I's favorite things to do, especially with couples. And um, I like to guide myself through them. It's actually how I got very proficient as a guide. I, everything. I do it for myself first and I'm like, all right, I can do this for somebody else. Um, and so every now and then I'll feel called to one and I was in that journey. And as soon as I made that choice, so much light came in and I was like, ah, all right, great. I get to move on from this chapter. And, uh, the becoming is, the becoming is like learning through suffering while you're on a boat of pleasure. Like <laughs> you're in the middle of the storm, but this boat is just keeping you safe and whole. And you're like, Oh, wow, it's storming. Okay. Moving through this. Oh man, I made it through that. Hell yeah. Okay. On to the next thing. You know, it's just a lot, it's less sticky and it's not heavy. You know, that like heavy feeling that can, you can experience when you're just like weighing yourself down with my mom did this and this happened to me and all these things are happening in my life and I have no control. You know, when you just really go, no, these things are simply happening. I can choose how I experience this. I may not choose my initial triggers, but I can choose what I do with them. 
do you think we end up seeking that person in a relationship to try to heal some of the wounds we may have had growing up with that archetype? Not consciously. If we are willing to, ex if we're willing to expand our our capacity for considering the unknown, then I, because I try not to speak about anything that's woo woo. I like science and I like rational, logical, observable, trackable things. But my observation is there seems to be a very strong observable agenda that we are very attracted to the same type of energy that we struggle with in our childhoods. And there's probably trained psychologists and psychotherapists that could explain that professionally. I am just a relationship researcher. I share my findings. That's what I do. And my belief is that the prime directive of life itself is maturation. We live in a growth centric universe. We are designed to grow and evolve. And there are certain mechanisms in place. If we don't grow and evolve, things happen. And one of those things is that we often are attracted to the same type of energy as the, as the energy that we rejected in our childhood. So the universe is, okay, you've rejected that in, in, the, in your mother or father. You've rejected it in the world and you've rejected it in yourself. Now you're going to fall in love with it. And get into a home with it because you're not done with that and you need to realize rejecting that in yourself and the world is going to cause you uh, problems forever so my kind of sense is that the game of life or the universe or i don't mind if you're an atheist i love the arguments for atheism so if you're listening to this and you're an atheist don't worry i'm i'm, I'm close by but i've observed too much to believe that there is no um, intelligence in the invisible there is an intelligent agenda that is driving us to become mature. And what you just described is one of those very observable things. There's a saying that I love, which is seeing something as random is simply where our knowledge ends and our ignorance begins. It's the edge, it's basically it's where the edge of our understanding if our understanding ends. So when those things that we might perceive as random, like, oh, I randomly am with a person that reminds me of this parent who I had issues with. And um, just because our understanding doesn't go deep enough to understand, you know, to see why that's occurred, we can perceive it as random. Oh, what a coincidence. But um, I'm not sure there are those coincidences. I don't want to go too far down the that kind of path but the original definition of the word coincidence was two things to come together with intent we've added luck fortune and no intent to that word two things coincide they are coinciding to coincidence two things have come together like it's not supposed to suggest a fluke mm. and yeah. I, uh, I think that very little happens by mistake. I've got a few questions for you uh, from ChatGPT. Uh, I let it know that you were coming on the podcast <laughs> and what great. questions it might like to ask you. All right. And uh, I've, That's I've excellent. Said I, have, I had Hamilton Sauer coming on the podcast to discuss AI, consciousness, and God. He said, that sounds like an incredible episode. Having Hamilton Sadler on your podcast to explore the fascinating topics of AI consciousness and God is sure to ignite profound discussions and open new realms of understanding. It sounds like it's now selling it to me. In this captivating conversation, <laughs> Hamilton Sadler, renowned expert in consciousness exploration, will dive into the intersection of artificial intelligence and spirituality. Together, you will explore thought-provoking questions about the nature of consciousness, the potential of AI to enhance our understanding of reality, and, and the deep connection between technology and spirituality. What questions would it like to ask you? Okay. Here, here they are. Hamilton, with your shamanic journey and ayahuasca experiences, how was your, 
how has your perception of consciousness and the nature of reality been influenced? Have these experiences provided you with insights into the interconnectedness of all beings, including AI? That's actually a really impressive question. <laughs> I, uh, so I'm, I'm responding to chat GPT. I'm speaking to the AI now. Uh, fundamentally, yes, the ayahuasca ceremonies are an opportunity to transcend the illusion of separation and see into the interconnectedness of all things, including the technology of AI as soon as AI appears. And it's a, it's a fundamental shift in philosophy and a kind of mindset associated with how you look at life, the planet, um, the planet's part of a greater construct like solar system or galaxy, and then fundamentally universe. So if you start with a premise that everything is interconnected, we want to start to look at how that could actually be true. It's very easy to use space, time, and distance to describe how something is separate, but we can also use fundamental uh, concepts of field to show how things are all connected. Like for instance, of earth, which is this tremendous density, everything is connected at the field of the atomic. Atoms, it's just a, earth is a huge field of atoms. And that sort of atomic soup is structured in many different ways. But it doesn't change the fact that every single atom is ultimately connected to another atom that's part of Earth. Same thing with molecules. You can see that all of the molecules, which are the atoms aligned in bonds of different kinds of, of energy and strengths, ultimately are this massive field associated uh, of the molecules themselves. So you can identify an individual molecule and you can also look at all of the molecules together as a, as a tremendous field. You can expand that awareness. It's the same thing for a galaxy or for the universe at large. You can see where all the clusters of all the different atoms are and mm -hmm. all the different waves and all the different forms like gravitational waves. And you can start to see a rich uh, matrix of interconnectedness amongst all things and that there are strong forces and weak forces that are part of that interconnection. And that interconnection could be described uh, in a form of energy or as having a form of consciousness or intelligence in its own right, which is what people call spirit, a kind of true, a, 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 an essence that is directive, that has force, that has purpose, that has evolution associated with it. And you could look at the totality of that unity as an expression of God, source, divinity, wholeness, or oneness, and um, also the creator of all and, and continued uh, real-time creation of all. So not just in the past it was created, but it is currently being created and manifesting new always, and that that constant churn or constant change is part of the permanence of this incredible universe. All right, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that. Let me know in the comments below, what was your favorite clip? And hopefully you've come across one of the episodes that you may not have listened to yet, in which case, go check it out and watch the full episode. All right, thanks so much for being here. I'll see you on the next one.